Colossians 1.15 this morning. The question is, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? So many people, millions and millions of people around the world, around our country, even on this Long Island, have no idea who Jesus Christ is. And if they don't know who Jesus Christ is, they don't know the salvation in Jesus Christ. And people are very religious. And we know that. We live in a very religious world. But just because someone is religious does not mean they know Jesus Christ. So when you're at work and you're in a conversation with somebody and they're talking about Jesus, do not think it's the same Jesus you know of the Bible because they may have an entirely different idea of who Jesus is and they're worshiping or serving or following a false Jesus. So just stick with me just for a second. We're going to go on a survey of world religions or false religions, I will say, and their view on Jesus Christ. First off, Jehovah's Witness. What is their view on Jesus? First off, Jesus is not God. In their view, Jesus is Michael, the archangel. You may have heard this before. He came to earth, and he died. He didn't die on a cross. He died on a stake. And in his death on a stake, his body was destroyed and did not rise again. His spirit supposedly rose again, waiting for his return. And so Jehovah's Witness... If it's today, the Jehovah's Witness today, they've missed his return. Because Jehovah's Witness say that Christ returned spiritually in 1914. And that is the belief of Jesus, of the Jehovah's Witness. Mormonism. This is interesting because we've had um, political candidates that were Mormon in the past, and they kind of made headline news. Jesus Christ is the spirit child of Elohim and his heavenly wife. We don't know her name. But let's say Mrs. Elohim. And this heavenly mother birthed Jesus. And when Jesus came to earth, he needed a physical body. And so Elohim left heaven and came to earth and had a sexual union with Mary, creating the body for Jesus to then come in. And Mormonism, actually, if you look at the identifiers of a cult, they meet all four identifiers of a cult, along with other, uh, other ones we're talking about today. Jesus Christ of Mormonism is not Jesus Christ of the Bible. Jesus Christ of the Unification Church. The Unification Church says that Jesus Christ's father was not God, was not even Joseph, the earthly father. He was born of Zechariah. Not even sure where they get that from. But Jesus was born from Zechariah, a perfect man. And in his perfection, he came to find the perfect wife. But he failed in his mission. Which, that questions, is he perfect? <laughs> he failed in his mission. And Christ then returned, or went to heaven, ascended to heaven, and then returned in the person of Sun Myung Moon, the founder of the Moonies. The Unification Church. Christian Science. Jesus was not Christ, but was a man that had the Christ idea, which I'm not sure what that means either. Scientology. Now, Jesus is rarely mentioned in Scientology, but sometimes he is mentioned. If he is, he's known as the operating thetan, which means he has going to the level of perfection through the purging of engrams, which I guess is their idea of sin. And if you were able to watch the best Super Bowl last Sunday, there was a commercial on during the Super Bowl. As the Eagles were winning, you went and looked at the commercial, and it was a commercial for Scientology. And there was all kinds of things of science and DNA twisting on the screen and, and these little machines and people's hands grabbing the machines, which is what purges the engrams through the engram purging machine. And at the end of the commercial, it said, are you curious? And a question puts the person in a position that they have to answer the question. And the next thing on the screen, it says, we thought so. The Church of Scientology, a false religion, doesn't even believe in Jesus. Islam. Alongside Muhammad, Jesus is one of 124,000 prophets of Allah. Jesus is not God. Jesus is not the Son of God. In fact, if you said that he was, you are blaspheming Allah. 
I want to quote to you from Surah 9, chapter 9, verse 30. This is from the Quran. The Jews called Uzair a son of Allah, and the Christians call Christ the son of Allah. That is a saying from their mouth, and this they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. Allah's curse be on them. How they are deluded away from the truth. Jesus is not the Son of God in Islam. And so, if a Christian, maybe you're sitting here today, but if a Christian says that the God of the Bible is the same as Allah of the Quran, you're deceived. It is not the same. God of the Bible is not the same as Allah of the Quran. We think of the nation of Islam, that's a religion, and they have a view of Jesus. Jesus is the sinless prophet of Allah. He was born to Mary and Joseph in adultery because Joseph had another wife. And he did not die on the cross. He was walking in the street of Jerusalem and a police officer stabbed him to death. And then he has returned, he has come back to earth in the personages, in the person of Louis Farrakhan or Master Fard. That's the belief of the nation of Islam in regards to Jesus. Judaism. Judaism does not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They reject him as the Messiah. He is not the Son of God who came and rose from the dead. And they continue to wait for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come and establish the earthly kingdom for the Jews. And the thing is, we do praise the Lord for Jews that believe in Jesus Christ. They're called Messianic Jews. They believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the Messiah, and they have true salvation. But Judaism in general, they reject Jesus as the Messiah. Buddhism, Jesus is not even part of Buddhism. If he is mentioned, he is an enlightened teacher. And Hinduism, not a part of Hinduism, but if he is mentioned, Jesus is an avatar of Vishnu. This is the view of Jesus Christ, and there's many others, across our world and across our land. And I'm here to tell you without any hesitation in my voice, who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is God. And in this vile world we live in, this blasphemous world we live in, the culture we live in today, offending God, sinning against God, having other gods in front of the true God, we are here today to worship the true God and Jesus Christ is the true God. Fallen man looks for answers. We look for answers all the time. Fallen man looks for answers, and they want to know of some kind of being out there. Romans 1 says that, that it's written on our hearts to know the general re revelation in creation, to know the Creator so man is without excuse. They want to know, but they look in all the wrong places. And they go and they search, and they search fallen man's ideas, and false religion comes from fallen man, so they're worshiping a fallen Jesus in that fallen religion. They look to themselves for the answer, when the truth is, all they have to do is look right here. And you have this in your hand. You have this in your home. You have this, hopefully you're taking it to work, a pocket New Testament or something. And you have the truth to talk with the lost about the true God. And the Scripture reveals who Jesus is. And today we're looking at Paul as he's writing to the church at Colossae about who Jesus is. And he tells who Jesus is. He tells that Jesus is God, flat out. And we're going to see that today. We're going to see that in the coming weeks here in our, pa in our uh, passage in uh, Colossians 1. So who is Jesus? We're going to look at one verse, verse 15 today, and just some catch up. Remember, uh, the Colossian church, the church at Colossae, was dealing with a spiritual attack in the city. It was called the Colossian heresy, where there was this false belief called Gnosticism. Now, don't get that confused with agnostic. Agnostic means not knowing and all that. This is a different thing. This is called Gnosticism. And, and what they did was they, they believed that God was holy, but matter was evil. And so if Jesus Christ Christ came in, in flesh, if Jesus Christ came in human form, then he was in matter, and so that he was evil, he was less than God. And they took away his deity. 
So what they did then was they said, well, we need to have some other way because he's not the, the true salvation is through him. He's not the true Jesus. So we have to have salvation in another way. And so they started bringing in other false beliefs. They started bringing in, in mysticism. They started actually uh, melding some things up with, um, uh, with Judaism and circumcision and all of that for salvation. And this is the believers in Christ in the church of Colossae and in the city it is bombarding them. So much so that the pastor of the church has to go to Rome to visit with Paul to get some advice on how to deal with this. And so the letter is written, the, the book of Colossians, written to the church to deal with this. So the false belief was hammering away at the deity of Christ. And Paul is saying, this is Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Look at Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Amen. Please pray with me. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to help us understand this, to help us understand that Jesus Christ is God. We pray your Spirit helps us block out any distraction. We want to give you our full attention. We want to give you true worship through the Word. We pray your Holy Spirit teaches us today. We thank you we can come to you right now in prayer as, as people are praying in their seats and lifting prayer to God right now through their mediator, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you answer our prayer and give us understanding. Father, for one that does not know Jesus Christ is not of the Spirit, the Bible says they will not understand the things of the Spirit. And I pray your Holy Spirit touches them and draws them close that they see the need for Jesus Christ and they call on Jesus Christ to be saved. We ask, Lord, for your blessing on the reading of your word and help us as we worship Jesus Christ, looking at the second person of the Trinity. We do ask, Father, for understanding. We thank you so much for who you are and the love that you have for us, that you have revealed this to us in the Scripture. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. On the back of the bulletin or message notes, like we usually have, it's filmed blanks uh, up there on the screen. But we see here Jesus Christ. Who is he? He is God. And we're going to be looking at, at some things in the, in the passages coming up in the next couple weeks. But today we're just going to look at this one verse. Because we see three reasons in this verse that prove that Jesus Christ is God. And if you mark in your Bible, I would uh, suggest that you underline some things or highlight some things. because These are, these are key attributes of who God is uh, in his deity as Jesus is God. And so we think first off, Jesus Christ is God because he is who he is. He is who he is. Pretty simple. And it's the first two words of the verse. Beginning in verse 15, well, that's the only verse we're in. The beginning of it, he is, Paul begins, referring to Jesus Christ. Referring back to the previous verse in verse 14. Remember verse 14 talked about the son of the father's love. And then he is. Well, who is he? It's pointing back to the Son. It's pointing back to Jesus Christ. And Paul launches into who Jesus Christ is, beginning with, he is. That's who Jesus Christ is. He is. When you think of the omnipresence of the triune God, God is, is uh, omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent. A lot of times we think, because we're, we're finite, we're stuck in our bodies and in this place or whatever, we think that, that omnipresence means God is everywhere in location. And that's true. God is everywhere in location. But he is also everywhere in regards to time. Omnipresent. God is outside of time. No matter where God is looking at time, it is present to him. God is not stuck somewhere in the past. God is not stuck somewhere in the future. He is outside of time, and looking at time, He is present. He is the omnipresent God. So Jesus Christ, God the Son, the, the second person of the Trinity, being outside of time, has always been. He is. Present tense. And this is nothing new. Maybe it's new for someone listening, but it's nothing new, especially in the Scripture. Jesus Christ Himself even says it. Look at John 8, 57 to 59. Jesus is having a back and forth with some Pharisees. And listen to this verse. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. That language incensed those Pharisees. 
How dare this man in front of us equate himself to God? That he was before Abraham, that he is I am. And the reason it incensed them was because they knew what God said to Moses from the burning bush. Look on the screen, Exodus 3, 13 to 14. Then Moses said to God, so Moses is speaking to God in the, in the burning bush. Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? So God has given Moses a charge to go get the nation of Israel from Egypt. And he's going to go there and say, Hey, God's telling me to do this. And they're going to say, Well, who sent you? Now, Egypt had thousands of gods. So he need, Moses needed to know, what am I supposed to say? And what's it say? Verse 14, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. <laughs> and now Jesus is stating the exact same thing to the Pharisees. He's saying before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> Jesus Christ is God. How can he say that? Because he's God. That's how Jesus Christ can say, I am. He doesn't have to reason with anybody for it. He doesn't have to have permission from anybody for it. Jesus Christ is God, and he can stand there with all authority of the Godhead and say, I am. Jesus Christ, he is who he is. If Jesus Christ became God, if Jesus Christ was created into God, he wouldn't be God. Because that means at one time he was not, so he couldn't say, I am. Jesus Christ was not created. Jesus Christ has always been. He is the creator, and we're going to be looking at that today. We're going to be looking at it next week. But just listen here to John 1.1 1, 1, and then 14a, the beginning of 14. We'll see the end of 14 later on this morning. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Key. The Word was God. Now verse 14. And the Word became flesh. Who is that? Jesus Christ became flesh. The Word was God. And He became flesh when He came as a baby, when He was born of the Virgin. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We'll get to that here just in a few minutes. In the beginning, John says. What's he referencing? He's referencing creation. In the beginning of the world, in the beginning of our time, when God created the earth, the Word was there. And if it means was there, it means it pre-exists before the creation. And this is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, He was there at creation. And we're going to see some beautiful verses coming up here about Jesus Christ being the Creator. Significant meaning there. And Jesus, again, showing his deity, showing who he is as God, as he is praying to the first person of the triune God, God the Son, praying to God the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's a great look at prayer because he prays. He prays for his disciples. He prays for himself. He prays for you, future believers. What a great look at the prayer of Jesus Christ. But when you think of Jesus Christ praying to the Father, it says in John 17, 3 to 5, and this is eternal life that they may know you. You want eternal life? You need to know God. That's what the verse says, that the Bible says, what the truth says. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus Christ was always there. He has always been. He is it's the perfect evidence that we see here. Perfect that Jesus Christ is the eternal God. And he has always been the Jesus Christ of then, of eternity past, and today, and eternity future. Jesus Christ, he is God. We think of, we think of this. We continue to go looking in, in the book of John. And John writes these things. John even says in his, in, in his book, John writes these things that you may believe in Jesus Christ. And we just continue thinking of John 8, 21 to 24, about God the Son. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So these are unbelieving Jews he's talking to. 
So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, i.e. creation, I am not of this world outside of creation. Jesus Christ is God. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe on the great I am, if you do not believe on Jesus Christ of the Bible, you will die in your sins. It's direct, it has direct application for today, direct application for unbelievers today, because there's only two kinds of people in front of me, either believers in Christ or not. You either believe in the true Jesus Christ or you believe in something else, a false Jesus, you believe in some other God, you believe in something else. We almost believe in the true Jesus Christ, not some knockoff Jesus, not some half Jesus, not some, not some religious idea of Jesus. Remember, I started all this morning with all these ideas of, of what the world religions say about Jesus Christ. It's the Jesus Christ of the Bible. That is what we believe. That is who we believe in. And eternal life is found in Him. And if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you will die in your sins. But when you believe on Christ, He came to this earth and died on the cross to take that penalty of death and take that penalty for sin away and cover you and give you salvation and give you eternal life. The question for you is, are you saved? Do you believe on Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God. Do you believe on God? He is who He is. But then secondly, we see Jesus Christ is God because He is the image of the invisible God. And pretty much this outline is the verse re rewritten. He is the image of the invisible God. Just in the middle of the verse, He is, there it is, the image, underline image. It's key. He is the image of the invisible God. And Paul now unfolds this and gives us these attributes of Christ. And he begins the discourse of who Christ is. And, and we'll be studying this, as I said, for the next couple of weeks as we continue on in Colossians chapter 1. But it says Jesus Christ is the image a very special word in the Greek. The Greek word, here we go, Sunday school class. We talked about it earlier. The Greek word is icon. E-I-K-O-N. So what English word do you think we get from that? Icon. icon. Yeah, no tricks. We get icon. And icon means exact likeness. And so where do we see icons usually? We usually see it on the computer. And so when you want to go on the computer, you click on the icon. That's where I have a picture here on the screen of two icons. All right, so what does this mean? What's the W mean? Word. It means Microsoft Word. We know this, right? Okay. What's the X mean? Excel. Excel. Right, I knew Vicky would have that. Works there in the office. Excel. So when you click on this icon, the word icon, there it is on the screen. You click on that, what opens up? Everything there is for Word. Everything that Word contains is in that icon. When you want to open up an Excel spreadsheet, do you hit the W? No. You hit the X. Because when you click on the X icon, it opens up Excel. And everything that's in Excel is in that icon. And it's the exact same idea or principle here for Jesus being the image of God. Everything of God is in Jesus Christ. He is not the same as God the Father. He is not the same as God the Holy Spirit. But everything to do with God is in Jesus Christ. He is the icon. He is the exact image. So how does this work? John 4, 24 says this, God is spirit. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So if God is spirit, what's this with God being in the flesh, God the Son? What's going on there? In the promised plan of God, for salvation to occur, blood had to be shed. Physical blood. It says there's no atonement from sin unless blood has been shed. That's what the Bible says. And so physical blood had to be shed. Somebody had to die. If God is spirit, that means God needed to send somebody in the flesh that would be the perfect sacrifice. 
Sin can't get rid of sin. It had to be someone perfect. And who was that? It is Jesus Christ. He humbled himself. He humbled himself to become a man. He was in glory. And he humbled himself to become a man. He humbled himself to submit to the Father in his humanity to go to the cross. He was born a very physical life. He lived a perfect physical life. He is, Jesus Christ is sinless. And then he died a very real physical death. He stood in front of a very real Pilate. And Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? Pilate was even asking who Jesus is. Are you the king of the Jews? And after they wanted him crucified, it was a very real scourge, scourging, very real whipping, very real stripes, very real crown of thorns crushed on his head, a very real cross, very real nails, and a very real death. And then that very real physical body was taken off the cross and placed in a very real borrowed tomb. And we had, on the third day, Jesus Christ's power over death, and he rose from the grave in a very real body. It was not some kind of spiritual thing. Right? He rose bodily from the grave. His, his body wasn't taken hidden somewhere for millennia and it's destroyed like that other false religion believes. He rose bodily from the grave. That's why Thomas could see. And notice Thomas didn't touch. Thomas said, I'll believe when I touch. And Jesus said, here it is, Thomas. And he said, my Lord and my God. If you think Thomas touched... You're putting things in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible to say Thomas touched the hands of Jesus. He saw and he believed. But it's better for those that believe without seeing. We have faith in Jesus Christ. He is God. So we think of this, he being the image of God. He became man, the God-man. Look at the verse up on the screen, Colossians 2.9. We'll get to this here in a couple of weeks. For in him, meaning Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ is God. He's the icon. Everything in him is God. So Jesus was not a man that became God. Jesus is not half man and half God. Jesus is fully man and fully God, 100% man, 100% God, called the hypostatic union, the perfection that took place when Jesus Christ came to this earth, humbling himself as God, perfect God, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and died the only death that could take away sin. Jesus Christ, in him, is the Godhead bodily. The writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The glory of Christ, the image of Christ. You think about the image of Christ. One of the first places in the Bible it talks about image was God saying that he's going to create man. And he said, we will create man in our image. And so he created Adam. And we are in the image of God. Well, Adam was made in the image of God. Jesus Christ is the image of God because he is God. He came, continuing the verse in verse 3 of Hebrews 1, and upholding all things by his word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. It's the God-man Jesus came in the flesh to take that penalty for us, to purge our sins. And he rose from the grave. And now he's presently today. What's he doing? He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you. We are here. And we are saved. If you're a Christian, you are saved. But we have to go through our mediator, Jesus Christ. And where is Jesus Christ? At the right hand of the Father, mediating for you. That we can go to the Father. We cannot even go to the Father but through Christ. Why? Because he is God. We go to the first person of the Godhead through the second person of the Godhead, empowered by the third person, the Holy Spirit of the Godhead. And he's at the right hand of the Father, John 1, 14. Now look at the end of it. We've looked at the first part. We'll read the whole thing. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the icon, Jesus Christ, you look at what's in Jesus Christ, in God, He's full of grace. He's full of truth. And this is what God gives us at our salvation, the, the grace of God. 
And God doesn't run out of grace. If he ran out of grace, that means he's deficient in some way and he's not God. God will never run out of grace and he pours that grace on us at salvation. And then as we are living, we live in God's grace. As he takes care of us and helps us, grows us spiritually. But also, he's full of truth. Again, truth, it's a, it's a word that is just kicked around today, left and right. Truth is destroyed. Make up your own truth. It's relative, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus Christ is the truth. He says that. I am the way, the truth. I am, he's saying that he is the truth. And so if you have been saved, Christian, your Savior is truth, no matter what takes place on this earth. You can't have all kinds of Jesuses like those false religions. There can only be one true Jesus. Amen. And it's the Jesus of the Bible. The very opposite of all of those false religions and cults and beliefs and ideas out there. The thing is, the world is okay with Jesus, just not the Jesus of the Bible. They're okay with someone worshiping Jesus, whatever. Your, work, your, your co-worker might say that. Oh, that's good for you. That Jesus guy, he's good for you. But... Not for me. They're okay with you worshiping your Jesus. Just don't bring it, bring Jesus to them. But they will follow a false Jesus. They will follow that. They'll fall further into darkness because they're already in darkness. That's why Jesus Christ, who is the light of life, has given us that charge to take the light of the gospel to the dark world. And so if your coworker, or your friend, or your loved one, or whatever, does not believe in Jesus Christ, we talk to them about Christ, the true Christ. Because you never know what knock on the door might, might, might take place. You had the opportunity to share the truth, and you didn't. And later in the day, hi, we're two people from so-and-so church, and we'd like to tell you, you know what? There's no hell. And that person says, oh, I'll listen to that. And next thing you know, they're following a false Jesus. We have the light. We have the gospel. It is the truth of Jesus Christ, the image of God. He is the icon of God. Do you have Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or are you rejecting him like the world? And lastly this morning, Jesus Christ, he's first God because he is who he is. He is the image of the invisible God. And thirdly, he is firstborn over all creation. Firstborn over all creation. All right, so that's right there at the end of the, end of the verse, verse 15, the firstborn over all creation. Obviously, underline firstborn, that's a, that's a big one. We'll talk about creation a little bit today. We'll definitely talk about creation next time. But Jesus Christ, the firstborn over all creation. So Paul continues this letter here. And now the original letter to Colossae uh, would not have been broken into chapters and verses. It would have been one long letter. But we break it up. And what it's doing is pointing to the, pre uh, the, the upcoming verses. Verses 15 and into 16 and dealing with, with creation. But the main focus I want to look at here is firstborn. And this is caused, I, I'm telling you, when you start looking at theology and Christology, and that's the doctrine of Christ, and all the beliefs out there, this phrase and this verse has really caused men to go haywire. They start thinking all kinds of crazy stuff because of the word firstborn. They start thinking this false belief that Jesus was created. Because he was born in the flesh, that means that that's when he began. And many false beliefs believe that, that, man, that, that Mary had a baby and then, then this, this God idea was put into him or something. God, God began. Jesus began then. And that's a false belief. We've got to understand the word firstborn. It means a position or a title or a rank. It does not necessarily mean the first person born or, or the oldest child or whatever it may be. It does not mean Jesus Christ's birth to Mary. It does not believe, mean Jesus Christ is created. And we think of, of David, King David, being called the firstborn. Look at Psalm 89, 27. This just kind of hammers home the point. Also, I will make him, my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. In that context there, God is saying, I will make David my firstborn, and he will be the greatest king. That's what God is saying there. Was David the first king? No, it was Saul. So right there, he's not the first king. Was David the firstborn of Jesse? No, he was the youngest. 
David had all kinds of older brothers. So David's not the firstborn of Jesse, and he's not the first king. So what in the world's going on here? God is saying that David is the firstborn because his rank or his, his position is going to be the greatest king of the nation of Israel on earth. David was the greatest king. And so Jesus is saying that, or God is saying that. Also, um, the nation of Israel is called the firstborn of God. A whole nation is the firstborn of God. Was the nation of Israel after Abraham, coming after Abraham, was that nation the first nation ever to exist? No. There's other nations in the book of Genesis before Abraham. So what does that mean? It means that they are the chosen people. It means that they have a high, the highest rank for God. They are the firstborn for God. And the same way, Jesus Christ is the firstborn. He is, it's the, it's the highest rank. And again, it's pointing to verse 18. And hopefully as you've been reading Colossians chapter 1 especially, verse 18, you have preeminence like circled like a hundred times. That's the whole topic of our, of our series through Colossians, about Christ being the preeminent. He's the firstborn. He is the one that's above all. He is the highest of rank because he is the preeminent God. If there was anything above Christ, what would that make that thing? God. And what would that make Christ? Not God. No, Christ is preeminent. He's above all. And he is God. We think of John. Again, saying this, John has so much to say. I love the book of John. John 1, 3. So again, it's that whole word. Jesus Christ is the word. Jesus Christ became flesh in, in verse 14. And then John 1, 3, so kind of right after John 1, 1, speaking of, of Jesus Christ being the living word. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So who is directly involved in creation? Jesus Christ. It's speaking of the Word who became flesh, and He's the one that made creation. He's the Creator. And it says all things, all things of creation were created by Jesus Christ. So, so it's not evolution. It is not evolution or some big bang. Not some, some God particle out there that we talked about a couple weeks ago in our, in our theology Sunday school class. And, and that, that, that God particle thing, is just, it, it just blows my mind. Secular scientists and evolutionists, they're trying to find the beginning of the universe. And so they, they've narrowed it down, and, and they, they just can't say God of heaven. They have to make this particle God. And that begs the question, where did the particle come from? <laughs> and they have no answer. And so what they do is they try to schmooze it over and they say, God particle. And it's all false. God created the universe. God is the creator of everything and Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ is the creator. And we just think of the universe. I mean, I'm telling you what, the vastness of the universe amazes me. And I don't know if you're into looking at stars or the, the universe or anything like that. But our family, not the Sandiford side, but Jenny's side, has a little bit of notoriety in this. The Sandiford side has no, like, no one famous. But Jenny, her side of the family, has somebody famous in it. Jenny's maiden name is Hubble. Oh, <laughs> Hubble. Jenny's great-great-uncle is Edwin Powell Hubble the inventor of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we have a picture of that on the screen. Oh, wow. He invented the Hubble Space Telescope. And there are many scientists that did it. It's named after him. But we think about that. This telescope allows us to see the vast parts of the universe. Now this man, unfortunately, was an atheist and he died in his sin. But we have images from this space telescope that he helped invent and we can see how vast God is. The first picture up there on the screen is Mystic Mountain. Look at the size of that thing. You know how big that is? If you start at the bottom of that and you travel to the top of that, it would take you three light years to go. So you, if you hopped on a particle of light, moving at 186,000 miles per second, it would take you three years to get from the bottom to the top of that mystic mountain. And it's, it's gases and it's, it's stars and nebula and all kinds of stuff in that massive thing out there in space. 
The, the, the next slide. Glittering Messier, I guess you say it. Look at that. Where'd it come from? A big bang? Particles colliding together? Who created that? The next slide. This is Alpha Centauri star cluster. Okay, Alpha Centauri is not the universe. Alpha Centauri is a little piece of the universe. And you look at that picture, and they believe, I mean, they can't count them. Only God knows the number of stars. Over 10 million stars in Alpha Centauri cluster. Who did that? Jesus Christ did it. With his word, he created the heavens. He, he flung the sun out there, the same sun that shone down on him as he hung from the cross. He created it. That is how great Jesus Christ is. That is how vast Jesus Christ is. That is how vast God is, and Jesus Christ is God. That is how vast he is. Did you know that you can purchase a star's name? Did you know that? We, we did that one time when Jake was a baby. And there's a map. It was, oh, was kind of cool. There's a map, and they send you this map, and they circle it. They probably send it to a bunch of people, but they circle it, and they say, this is now named Jacob Sandiford, the star. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that star already had a name. And that name was given by Jesus Christ. He is the creator, and he created the stars. He created the vastness of, of the universe. And yet in our culture today, myriads and myriads of people in college, universities, public school are force-fed evolution. Yes. Do not teach creation. It's against the law. But you can teach Big Bang. You can teach that something came from nothing. And that doesn't even make logical sense. How can something come from nothing? But yet they teach it. So if you're a parent of a, of a, a teenager or a high schooler, if you're in high school today, evolution being taught to you from the lectern in the classroom is a lie. It is a lie. Jesus Christ, the Savior, Jesus Christ is the creator. Amen. And he is the one that brought everything into existence. And we're going to see how everything is held together by him coming up here. Jesus did it all. He is over his creation. And so right there, that word over his creation means that he's outside of it. He presides over it. He is the sovereign God. God the Father alone is not the sovereign God. God the Father is sovereign. Jesus Christ is sovereign. The Holy Spirit is sovereign. God is sovereign over his creation. And we are his creation. And he loved us so much that when man fell, when man sinned, when man rebelled against God, and the penalty for that sin is death, he said, I have the solution. I'm not going to leave it up to man to come up with a solution. The only solution that would be satisfying to God was God himself. And he sent Jesus Christ, God the Son, to the cross for you and for me. We say, why this? Why all this creation and, and um, you know, talk about Jesus and the preeminence and all of it? I'm so glad you asked. Paul says it in Romans. This is why. Romans 11, 36. Why? For him, for of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ, he is over all creation. He has created it for his glory. And everything that goes on within it, in his creation, that he, he is the creator and he holds it together, it's for him and through him and to him. And all the glory goes to him. And so when sinful man forgets God, when sinful man rejects God, goes against God, don't worry because creation praises God. The Bible tells us that. In the, book, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about mountains and hills bursting forth in song, and trees in the fields will be clapping their hands. His creation praises him and gives him the glory. The psalmist also says that the, the earth worships God and that the heavens sing praise to God. God's creation worships the creator, and we Christians, we are his creation. We are his special people. And we worship our Savior, Jesus Christ, because He is God. He is above all. What will you do with Jesus? 
It is so clear in the Scripture. Jesus is God. What will you do with him? Pilate, I brought Pilate up earlier. Pilate was pretty much in that same predicament. What should I do with Jesus? Should I let him go or should I give him over to, the, the, to be crucified? What should I, well, what are we doing with Jesus? If you're a Christian today, and if you can sit here and say, I'm a born again believer, I am a Christian, Almighty God of the universe has saved me. If you can sit here and say that today, yes, I'm saved, does your life show it? Are we living a life that is honoring to the creator of the universe? That is honoring to the life that Christ gave for you? Is Christ your life? Or is Christ part of it? Is Christ kind of just stuck in there when we get to Christ? Or get to the Bible? Or, or maybe just on Sunday morning, we'll get to Christ. Everything else we got to do but we'll get to Jesus when we get to him. Is that our life, Christian? Are we, are we just making Jesus part of He is almighty God, creator of you, creator of the universe. And we worship him as such. But if you do not know Jesus Christ, you, you're sitting here and you're like, I don't even know about this. I've never believed on Jesus. I thought Jesus of, of the Quran and Bible were the same or whatever it is. You need salvation. You need Jesus Christ. Because if you refuse, if you reject, it's just like how Jesus said to the Pharisees, you will die in your sins. But the good news is, and if, if you're not a believer today, you've heard the good news. The gospel of Christ, that Jesus Christ paid that penalty for you. And you must believe on him. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And the Bible says you will be saved. Jesus Christ is God. Because he is who he is, he is the image of the invisible God, and he is the firstborn of all creation. We worship Jesus Christ today because he is God.